Hey everybody, uh, good morning and welcome to the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School and our Wisdom of the Soul class for, uh, what is today? Sunday, May 7 of 2023. Great class for you today. The topic is Echo Spirituality. It may even be a new term for you. I have and many others have used the ecosystem and the uh, concern about the environment uh, as a, a parallel or an allegory for spirituality for many, many years, because it's perfectly obvious when you look at the ecosystem, the way diversity is an integral part of holism. And while it seems paradoxical that for something to be whole, it has to have many unique parts, the environment or the ecosystem is a perfect example of that. The interreliance and interdependence of all these uh, myriad of life forms, plant and animal, and their relationship to the mineral kingdom is so remarkable that the unity and the harmony comes out of this need for diversity. And so we can pick up a little bit on where we left off last week, our discussion of the conscious and unconscious mind, and step it up to a discussion of, in the absolute sense, the one mind, the universal mind, the the, the cosmic mind, so to speak, the Godhead, um, first cause, prime mover, the absolute, as of uh, an enormous unified electromagnetic field of energy, which uh, religiously oriented metaphysical people call spirit or consciousness. It's all energy, right? This is where we bridge esoteric philosophy, quantum physics, and basic fundamental laws of, of physics is uh, energy is spirit and it's consciousness. And consciousness behaves like all other forms of energy, whether it's heat or light or uh, nuclear radiation, uh, it's energy. It's energy. There's physical energy, there's metaphysical energy, and the latter, the metaphysical, we refer to as spirit. So there's one magnetic energy field that uh, religious people call God, and again, philosophy, maybe the absolute prime mover, the source. And it's undifferentiated, but then it gets differentiated or individuated so that each of us gets a little fragment of that. And before we do the meditation, let me just say this much about it, that <clears throat> this is very much like radio. If you think about tuning uh, uh, the dial on, a, on an old radio, uh, most of you, I'm sure, remember radio. If you tune that dial from one end to the other, AM or FM, there are many radio stations. Uh, besides what your AM or FM radio would receive, there are shortwave radio stations and uh, amateur radio operators and uh, international shortwave stations operated by governments and nations around the world. There's, uh, you know, walkie-talkies and... Uh, the the uh any any wireless cell phones is radio we don't think of cell phones as radio but i have radio receivers that receive cell phones uh that's all they are interestingly about 20 years ago uh scanners that received cell phone frequencies were outlawed and so the only ones that are around are either bootlegged or um, left over from the old days. 
but it's all radio, right? And so the question is, if this entire electromagnetic spectrum has these hundreds or even thousands of radio signals on it, what allows them to be discrete? Why don't all these radio stations get mixed up? And uh, it's because each has a different frequency. Sometimes on the AM dial, especially late at night, if propagation is right, you may hear two stations at the same time on the same frequency. That's just because they are, in fact, assigned the same frequency, and usually they're far enough away that the signals don't mix. But um, if you consider then this as an allegory for the way universal or cosmic consciousness extends itself, becomes uh, differentiated, and uh, each of us has a fragment of the one mind, and it is accessible through the unconscious mind. Wisdom of the soul is all about listening to the voice of the soul and contacting your higher self. Psychedelic experiences, you just, your awareness becomes expanded to such an extent that your, your brain can't really handle it. So consider it as being like radio. Each of us, if we think of ourselves as energy rather than matter, has our own frequency, right? We have not only fingerprint evidence and DNA proof of our individuality, but as energy beings, as spiritual beings, we each have our own frequency. And so in that way, this paradox of the one in the many, of the universe being this cohesive, unified, electromagnetic cloud or ocean or field of energy can carry all these different frequencies and they don't get mixed up. There is ESP, of course, and telepathy and clairvoyance or remote viewing and precognition and such. Jung's collective unconscious. And uh, I don't want to ramble on too much about this other than to say after our opening meditation, we're going to use the ecosystem in the environment as a further allegory for this so that we can better understand this enigma of the one in the many. How can we all be part of one thing and yet each be unique and get over that hurdle of, well, they're different, they even seem to be opposite, so how could they both be true? Well, they can be. <laughs> you know, how could a coin have two sides? Or a pair of glasses be one thing? A pair of pants, a pair of gloves is one thing, right? So uh, we'll work through that. It's a very important concept. It's really basic to metaphysics to be able to straddle that fence and to understand the truth in both of these views, that we're all part of one thing. There's just one of us here. And yet we do extend ourselves like a myriad of radio stations into these individual forms and both things are true. Remember we talked a few weeks ago about the two truth doctrine may want to Google that sometime, the two truth doctrine, the absolute and the relative, not either or, the absolute and the relative, the objective and the subjective. And while a little mind boggling at first, when you work that clay and soften it up a little bit, get your brain around it, wow, it's so cool. Because you can look like we will today at nature at a single tree, at a single blade of grass, and see the universe in it. Um, wasn't it William Blake that had a line about the universe in a grain of sand? What does that mean? Well, is the ocean not in the drop, right? What, what about the ocean is not in the drop? 
The drop appears to be separate from the ocean. The ocean is not separate from the drop. Okay, with that as a foundation, let's do our opening meditation. So we'll get comfortable in your chairs or uh, wherever you may be seated, sofa, cross-legged on your bed, meditation pillow. Close your eyes and begin to relax, experiencing yourself as balanced and centered so that you can sit upright without any tension, without any rigidity in your muscles. Think of your body as nicely balanced. And take three or four nice, slow, deep breaths, inhaling through your nose slowly. Hold for just a beat as you peak and exhale just as slowly through the nose or the mouth. And feel the letting go, going beyond where you'd normally stop. Pause for just a beat and then inhale again. At least four or five seconds per breath. In and then four or five seconds out. And as you become more and more relaxed, you'll find that you're able to slow it down even further, maybe eight or 10 or 12 seconds on an inhalation and eight or 12 seconds on the exhalation. Slow it down. And continue to feel your body softening from head to toe, muscles relaxing, unwinding, feeling very safe. Drop that suit of armor. Drop your sword and shield. Allow yourself to feel open and receptive. Safe and relaxed. And then allow your breathing to return to normal. Allowing your body to breathe itself. And bring your awareness to the bottom of your nose. And for just a minute or two, watch your body breathing itself. This brings us into the present moment. It creates a point of interest and a degree of non-attachment, understanding that those slow, deep, purposeful breaths were done by you as the breather. But now your body breathes itself. And so you are no longer the breather. You are the one who watches. You are your awareness of the body breathing itself. You are your awareness of your body being breathed for you. And so you feel even more letting go. And you experience the freedom of knowing you need not 
breathe yourself. Let these things are handled for you. And as you identify as that awareness, you understand it as consciousness. And in Western religion and psychology as love, more than an emotion, agape, charity, capital L, love, is consciousness. Awareness. To be aware of being aware. And you say to yourself, I am that. Behind my ability to breathe deliberately and purposefully is my awareness of allowing my body to breathe itself. Behind my thinking is an awareness that allows me to watch the thoughts bubble up, those tasks unrelated, intrusive, drifting trains of thought. Instead of being the thinker, we can be the awareness of those thoughts. And so too our emotions. Instead of fixating on the idea that someone made you feel this way, or some event or circumstance is responsible for the way you feel in this moment. Instead of identifying as that feeling, be the awareness of the feeling. How strong is this feeling? And instead of thinking about the feeling or trying to reason your way through it, simply feel it without judgment. Imagine the feeling has color. What are you feeling now? And what color comes to mind? Imagine the feeling or a set of feelings that you are experiencing right now in this moment as not only color, but texture and temperature Imagine carefully reaching out to touch it. Be that aware of the feeling. And so too our behavior, instead of 
reacting reflexively without thought, much less consideration of the consequences of a particular behavior. What if we deliberately choose our behavior from a list of options and choices? And after careful consideration, initiate that behavior as speech or action. Beyond thinking, there is the awareness of intrusive thoughts that we call thinking, but they're not deliberate thoughts. And beyond our emotions is the awareness of how we feel and its various qualities the rise and the fall, the ebb and the flow of an emotion. And beyond our behavior is variable awareness. And our relationships and our perception of the world around us, as we learn to identify as the awareness we awaken. We see more. All of our senses, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, subtle, intuitive feelings in the body become richer, more meaningful as we begin to realize we are that awareness of the world around us. Imagine yourself outdoors in a beautiful natural area, maybe some national park somewhere that is roadless, undeveloped, and left in its natural state. And you Imagine yourself wandering through this wilderness. Allowing my voice to guide you. Listen for the sounds of this place. Listen for the birds. And relax a little more. Listen for the sound of gentle breezes in the tops of the tallest trees. Listen. And feel those warm and wonderful breezes blowing across your face and gently through your hair. Imagine smelling the fragrances of nature carried on these gentle breezes. And something about it all encourages us to relax even more, to feel safer, 
somehow happier, more peaceful, and carefree as if time stands still. And there's no place else you'd rather be. And nowhere else you need to be. But right here. Right now. In a place that is so natural. We call it nature. Experience the deep feminine quality of nature. As you continue to wander through the forests, through the meadows, over mountains or through valleys, whatever occurs to you. Almost as if you remember from ancient times A feeling of living with such peace and tranquility. Something about it seems so familiar. So reliable. So perfect. And soon you come upon one particular spot that almost takes your breath away. It's so perfect and so beautiful. Seems to me there may be a little water here, maybe a little lake or a pond. Maybe a little stream spilling down the mountainside. And you find a grassy spot beneath a shade tree. Or a nice big rock that looks like the perfect place to sit. And you sit upon the earth. And you feel grounded, connected, rooted in the earth. And you relax even more. And you feel the peace and the contentment. And happiness for no reason, for no reason at all. Realizing you don't need reasons to be happy. And there's something in your field of vision. It may be a tree, one single tree, or a bush, maybe a flower, a single blade of grass. That you look at closely. 
like you've never seen it before. Like you're a child discovering for the first time the beauty and the curiosity, the the intrigue. You find the fascination in such a simple and natural thing. Perhaps it's just a pine cone or a nut that you found laying on the ground. Or you become fascinated by the sound, gentle though subtle as it may be, of the edges of the pond lapping on the shoreline, or the bubbling and splashing of the stream spilling down the hillside. And you don't have a care in the world. It's as if everything is okay. And you wonder, maybe everything is okay. Exactly as it should be. And maybe that's always been the case. But we removed ourselves from nature. We moved ourselves into cities. And busied ourselves with the affairs of men. And we know the reasons for that. We need not review all of that, but simply recognize the enormous benefits of reconnecting with the real world, with nature. There's something so inherently safe and relaxing so peaceful, so joyous about just being. Right here, right now. Without judgment. Without needing to fix or change anything. Without a problem to solve without a worry. For we are nature. And nature is us. The diversity of plant, animal, is essential to the unity of all things. The interreliance and interdependence of the animal kingdom drawing upon the plant kingdom, which draws upon the mineral kingdom. When you begin to see the perfect web of life. The connection of every seemingly separated thing 
to the one and the one in everything. This is peace of mind. This is goodness, truth, and beauty. Bring this awareness with you back to the waking state. In an effortless way, simply form the intention to remember this feeling and to recall it any time you feel frustrated or irritated, tired or exhausted, sad or depressed. Bring this simple joy, this truth into your awareness. Form the intention to return to the wide awake state. Feel a gentle rising up as if awakening in the morning from a deep sleep slowly. And three, eyes open, wide awake. Open your eyes now, wide awake, back in the room. Take a big breath. And as you exhale, stretch a little bit, maybe stomp your feet gently on the floor, get back into your body, feeling fine, feeling better than before. Feeling better than before. Good. Wow. Why did we ever leave for the city? <laughs> <clears throat> I want to do a little inventory with you guys. And if you want to write these responses down, if you have something to write on, I'm going to ask you 12 questions. And I want you to rate your response on a standard five-point scale where one is strongly disagree, two is disagree somewhat, Three is neither agree nor disagree. I'm sort of neutral. Three is 50-50. I don't know. Four would be agree somewhat. Yeah, to some degree I agree. And then five is strongly agree. All right. So one strongly disagree to five strongly agree. Three is neutral. And uh, I'll just go through these 12 statements. And... You can write down if you'd like, because we're going to add up the score at the end and see where you stand. No right or wrong to this. It's just an inventory. It's no, this is not about right answers and wrong answers, okay? Just to help you understand yourself better. And I think the questions are sort of cool. They come from a study that was done at the University of British Columbia about echo spirituality and human beings rediscovering their spiritual nature through physical nature. And uh, <laughs> it seems somehow appropriate that the study would be done in British Columbia, if you've ever been up there. All right, so you get it. Number one is strongly disagree. Five is strongly agree. And hopefully you have paper and pencil or pen by now. So here's number one. You ready? Do you agree, disagree, or are you somewhere in the middle? Jungles experience moods. Jungles experience moods. Strongly disagree. Two, disagree somewhat. Three, sort of on the fence, either way. Four, agree somewhat. Five, strongly agree. 
Jungles Experience Moods. Number two, deserts have their own emotions. Strongly disagree, disagree, neutral. Four, agree somewhat, five, strongly, agree. Deserts have their own emotions. Number three, the sky has personalities. These are questions that whether you agree or disagree and to what extent, this is more about intuition and feeling than logic. This is not reasoning, obviously. What do you think? The sky has personalities. Number four, forests can have thoughts. Strongly disagree, one to five strongly agree. Forests can have thoughts. Number five, I feel intense wonder for nature. I feel intense wonder towards nature. Agree, neutral, disagree. Number six, when I am in nature, I feel a sense of awe. Agree or disagree? Number seven, Sometimes I am overcome with the beauty of nature. Sometimes I am overcome with the beauty of nature. Strongly disagree to strongly agree, one to five. Number eight, there is nothing like the feeling of being in nature. Nothing compares. Nothing like the feeling of being in nature. Agree or disagree. One to five. Number nine. There is a spiritual connection between human beings and the natural environment. There is a spiritual connection between human beings and the natural environment. Agree or disagree? And to what extent? Number 10. There is sacredness in nature. Strongly disagree one, strongly agree five. One to five, there is sacredness in nature. Just two more. Number 11, everything in the natural world is spiritually interconnected. Agree or disagree? Actually, disagree to agree. <laughs> disagree is one, somewhat two, neutral three, agree somewhat is four, strongly agree is five. Everything in the natural world is spiritually interconnected. And 12, nature is a spiritual resource. Nature is a spiritual resource.
we know that there are natural resources. We use that term, natural resources. And uh, most people, if you ask them, well, what are our natural resources? They might say, oh, you mean like water or minerals, like gold and or, or diamonds and gems and metals like gold and silver and, you know, esoteric metals, lithium and cesium and plutonium. These are resources. But beyond looking at nature as resources to be exploited for our benefit, what if we look at nature as a sacred temple? And that we are part of nature and nature is part of us. And if we hurt nature, we hurt ourselves. In fact, I want to read you a little short essay by Krishnamurti about that today. But why don't you add those 12 numbers up? If you haven't already, just go ahead and add those 12 responses up. So if you scored strongly disagree on all of those, they'd add up to 12. If you were in strong agreement with all 12, you'd get 60. So somewhere between 12 and 60 is your score. And again, not right or wrong, but just how in tune are you with nature? And I think my next question for you would be, how much do you miss it? I mean, we have, uh, I don't know, 18, 20s, 22 people. I presume most of you are in cities. Could be anywhere in the world, but it's likely wherever you are, you're in a city. And uh, we have trees, right? And maybe there are city parks. That's nice. Maybe you have flowers or a vegetable garden in your yard. Where we live, we have cactus, <laughs> but they're beautiful. They have flowers and there's apples that fall off our cactus. And the flowers attract bees and other insects and moths and birds and bats. And they pollinate. The birds often eat the fruit that come from the pollinated flowers and carry the seeds for hundreds of yards or even miles, and then excrete the seed along with a little fertilizer packet. Some seeds have evolved to be carried upon the wind long distances. Quite remarkable the way nature evolves propagates itself. We are an extension of that. The earliest plants hundreds of millions of years ago evolved from the mineral kingdom, drawing upon the various minerals for the nutrients that they need, and then drawing upon the light and the warmth of the sun and water to become plants. I have seen in my wandering in the desert, cactus growing out of the side of a rock, no soil at all, quite miraculous, rooted in a rock, in the side of a rock. 
that's that's sturdy that's hardy <laughs> cause me to stop take a picture ponder that and so as the animals began to evolve they ate the plants which drew upon the mineral kingdom and then as the animals evolved from you know the lizards and the dinosaurs the reptiles uh, to the mammals and the primates there was a point a few million years ago just a few million years ago two three million years ago not that long ago the human beings swung down out of the trees and uh at last count i think we're up to 10 or 11 species of human beings all but one are extinct that's the homo sapien but we use the animals we eat the animals which eat the plants that draw upon the mineral kingdom and surely you see the interreliance. You see the connection. But it's more than a food chain. There is a uh, symbiosis. Do you know that word? An interreliance, an interdependence. There are species of fish, for example. I'm just pulling off the top of my head. There are species of fish that live and depend upon cleaning the teeth of sharks. That's what they do. There are countless examples, thousands and thousands of examples of animals relying on other animals in such a way that both species benefit from the presence of the other. I remember a fellow calling my talk show years and years ago, and uh, he was, uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, conservative, I guess he thought he was, some pro-corporate, big business thinker, and he challenged me. He said, Hoover Dam is no different than a beaver dam. And I said, you're not serious. And he said, yeah, it's just Hoover Dam is bigger, but... Why do you hippies all think big dams destroy the environment? Doesn't a beaver dam destroy the environment? And I said, well, besides the scale involved, Hoover Dam went up in like 10 years. But beaver dams have happened over millions of years. And so all of the plants and animals, the fishes, uh, the other critters that need the water and the fish in the water, they've all evolved slowly over that time as the beaver has evolved. And so there is this interlocking, inner dependence, this interreliance, this symbiosis or a natural evolution or unfolding, a natural growth and change promotes mutual benefit. And those that don't change die, become extinct, which is the future we face. Now, nature will go on. If humanity kills itself, if we destroy ourselves, if we lose the right to exist because of our foolishness, nature will survive. You don't have to worry about saving the planet, per se. It'll go on without us. It'll recover from global warming. Hell, look what happened during the pandemic. 
when everybody went on lockdown and uh, <laughs> I remember the picture of the 405 freeway in Los Angeles completely empty in the middle of the afternoon. It was unbelievable. Uh, it was a, a cover shot of the 405 where it crosses the 10 and the west side of town and there was not a car to be seen anywhere in the middle of the day. Do you know what happened to the air quality? Do you remember the news reports how the air quality within a day or two improved significantly? And people were talking about animals coming out. Bears and mountain lions and raccoons and badgers and all kinds of critters were coming down out of the hills within a day or two, <laughs> just because people freaked out and stopped driving. There were a couple of days there where nobody went any place. We were just paralyzed by fear. And nature will recover. Global warming, whatever you do to it, ozone levels, lack of oxygen, nature will go on. Other species will rise up. We have to qualify for our existence. It's the top of the hour, and in about five or five minutes or so, I want to go to the Q&A. So hopefully you're thinking of questions or comments on this whole idea of echo spirituality, the interconnectedness of all things, physically and metaphysically, materially, and in terms of energy, spirit, consciousness, awareness, the one in the many. Put a little note in the chat box, address it to Melinda, and uh, we'll go to the questions and or comments in just a few minutes. I want to read along these lines uh, a short little essay from Krishnamurti, the great theosophist, who spent most of his life in Ojai, California. Most of you are Californians. If you've ever been to Ojai, it's a great theosophical center. There's a place there called Meditation Mount that's associated with theosophy and Krishnamurti. Um, there's also an amazing old library called Crotona with a K. Crotona, the place just radiates this magic if you go into the place. It's like, wow. You should check it out sometime. It's a beautiful area of Southern California. And uh, Krishnamurti lived there for much of his life and said it reminded him of where he grew up in India. So this is a brief little essay I want to share with you that uh, I think this is about 20, maybe 30 years old. And the essay is titled, If You Hurt Nature, You Are Hurting Yourself. And I'm just going to read through this. It begins, what is nature? There's a great deal of talk and endeavor to protect nature, the animals, the birds, the whales, and dolphins, to clean the polluted rivers, lakes, fields, and so on. Nature is not put together by thought as religion and belief are. Nature is the tiger, that extraordinary animal with its energy and great sense of power. Nature is the solitary tree in the field, the meadow and the grove. It is the squirrel shyly hiding behind a bough. Nature is the ant, the bee, and all the living things of the earth. Nature is the river, not a particular river, whether the Ganges, the Thames, or the Mississippi. Nature is those mountains, snow-clad, with dark blue valleys and a range of hills meeting the sea. The universe is part of nature. One must have a feeling for all this, 
not destroy it. Nature is part of our life. We grew out of a seed, the earth, and we are part of all that. But we are rapidly losing the sense that we are animals like the others. Can you have a feeling for a tree? Look at it, see the beauty of it, listen to the sound that it makes. Can you be sensitive to the little plant, a little weed, to that creeper growing up the wall, to the light on the leaves and the many shadows? One must be aware of all of this and have that sense of communion with nature around you. You may live in a town, but you do have trees here and there, and a flower in the next garden, though it may be ill-kept. Crowded with weeds. But look at it. Feel that you are part of all of that, part of all living things. If you hurt nature, you are hurting yourself. One knows all this has been said before in different ways, but we don't seem to, <clears throat> we don't, excuse me, <clears throat> we, we, we don't seem to pay much attention. Is it that we are so caught up in our own network of problems, our desires, our urge of pleasure and, and pain, that we never look around, that we never watch the moon? Well, watch it. Watch with all your eyes and ears, even your sense of smell. Watch. Look as though you are looking for the first time. If you can do that, you see for the first time that tree, that bush, that blade of grass. Then you can see your teacher, your mother or father, your brother or sister for the first time. There is an extraordinary feeling about that, the wonder, the strangeness, the miracle of a fresh morning that has never been before and never will be again. Be in communion with nature, not verbally caught up in the description of it, but be part of it. Be aware. Feel that you belong to all of that. Be able to have love for all of that. To admire a deer, the lizard on the wall, that broken branch lying on the ground. Look at the evening star or the new moon without the world without merely saying, oh, how beautiful, how beautiful it is, and then turning your back on it, attracted by something else. But watch that single star and new delicate moon as though for the first time. If there is such communion between you and nature, you can continue with man with the boy. I misread that. You can, not communion, you can commune with man close. With the boy sitting next to you, with your educator or your parents, we have lost all sense of relationship in which there is not only a verbal a statement of affection and concern, but also this sense of communion, which is not verbal. It is a sense that we are all together, that we are all human beings, not divided, not broken up, not belonging to any group or race or some idealistic concept, but that we are all human beings living on this extraordinary, beautiful earth. Have you ever woken up in the morning and looked out the window or gone out onto the terrace and looked at the trees and the spring dawn? Live with it. Listen to all the sound, to the whispers, the 
slight breeze among the leaves. See the light on that leaf and watch the sun coming over the hill, over the meadow. And the dry river, or that animal grazing, those sheep across the hill, watch them. Look at them with a sense of affection and care that you do not want to hurt a thing. When you have such communion with nature, your relationship with another becomes simple, clear, and without conflict. This is one of the responsibilities of the educator, not merely to teach mathematics or how to run a computer. Far more important is to have something with other human beings who suffer, struggle, and have great pain, and the sorrow of poverty, and with those people who go by in an expensive car. If the educator is concerned with this, then he or she is helping the student to become sensitive, sensitive to other people's sorrow, their struggles, their anxieties and worries, and the rows that one has in the family. It should be the responsibility of the teacher to educate others, to have such communion with the world. The world may be too large, but the world is where he is. That is his world. And this brings about a natural consideration and affection for others, courtesy and behavior that is not rough or cruel or vulgar. The educator should talk about all these things, not just verbally, but he or she must feel the world of nature and the world of man. They are interrelated. Man cannot escape from that. When he destroys nature, he destroys himself. When he kills another, he is killing himself. The enemy is not the other, but you. To live in such harmony with nature, with the world, naturally brings about a different world. Krishnamurti. That obviously was addressed to teachers, but aren't we all? Uh, teachers, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't we like to have greater influence? That's that everyone and everything around us is our teacher, but the more you understand about life, the more you have to teach. Plus, I love this line. <laughs> I've always liked this phrase. He or she who teaches learns twice. There's nothing like teaching to accelerate learning. As you have to explain what you thought you knew. <laughs> you have to find the words for it. It's one of the reasons I enjoy doing this class. And I come from a family of teachers. All right, so uh, echo spirituality, the way in which the environment, the ecosystem uh, demonstrates the uh, the seeming paradox of the one and the many, how it takes great, grand diversity and an appreciation of it for there to be the whole or the one. What does the word holy mean? Holy holism. It's complete. It's the total. That's what holy means. Sacred, all that is. So if the great body of all that is, the universe is sacred in any way at all, if it's holy, then everything in it must also be sacred. And obviously we're not treating it that way. We don't think of the oil well as sacred. We don't think of the, the mines the deep caverns in New Mexico where nuclear waste is stored for the 40,000 years it'll take to decay as sacred. We don't behave like sacred people. We behave as if we worship technology. 
Oddly, the indigenous people of this continent, and I trust the world as well, in the pre-industrial times, those who lived close to the land recognized its sacred nature. And uh, when America was invaded by Europeans, or they like to say discovered, there were not a single stream was polluted. There was no litter. The air was not poisoned or toxic. Is it really worth the trade out? And do we have to go back to pre-industrial times or can we find a balance? See, I think we can. I think we can have high tech and appropriate tech and still recognize our inherent nature connected to all things. What's more spiritual than recognizing that all seemingly separate things are one? So with that, let's go to any questions or comments you may have. Melinda? My comment off the bat, that was a wonderful meditation and talk. Nature needs better lobbyists. <laughs> yeah. We have, we have two questions, and they're both pretty thought-provoking, provo Michael. Patrick asks, if God created the universe, couldn't the universe disappear in a millisecond? And then we'll go to Ignacio. Well, I think the, uh, that's a great question. Um, I've never really considered that. I suppose the material universe could disappear or be disappeared uh, as a expression or a manifestation of the energy behind it. Much of the universe is already invisible. In fact, the vast majority of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter cannot be seen. It does not uh, emanate light and it does not reflect light. It's invisible. You can't touch it. If you reached out, if you had a, a whole lot of dark matter and, and you know it's real because it has gravity associated with it. So that's the only reason we know that dark matter exists and dark energy as well, for that matter. For the universe is not slowing down in its expansion. It's accelerating. <laughs> well, why would the universe accelerate uh, 13 billion years after the Big Bang? Why is it still accelerating? Where is that energy coming from? There are other energies that we don't understand, so we call it dark energy. And somewhere on the order of 85 or 90% of the matter in the universe, we cannot perceive. It's already disappeared. It's already invisible. So we're just living in a little parcel, a little corner that we've evolved in, sort of a relative universe. You hear people talking about multiverses, but behind it all is an awareness, uh, a, a consciousness, a love, a passion, a, a, a wonder, a curiosity, a desire to be more, and an and urge, a longing to grow and expand and involve a, a, a metaphysical energy beyond space and time that I see as eternal and infinite, that has no beginning and no end. These are the teachings that resonate with me and most mystics. Um, I don't want to say it's true because I believe it, but um, I think even if the physical, dense, material universe that we know of were somehow to disappear, the eternal and infinite essence of it all would continue in some form or other. 
I don't know. You want to follow up on that, Jack? That was Patrick. Oh, Patrick. He may be driving. He, he may might not be, be driving. driving. Yeah. Oh, there he is. No. No, I'm lucky. I got somebody driving me now. And we need to get to Ignacio too. Of course, we will. What do you say, he, Yeah, I totally agree, Michael. What was the nature? Michael, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. When I said to disappear, it would be the material because the conscious awareness is just part of the creator. Right. Right. Am I okay. making progress? <laughs> well, that's for you to know. <laughs> uh, I think so. I like huh. it. I don't say. St I never said stuff like that before because I don't think I understood it. But with your help and uh, some other things going on, you know, it's all pointing in the direction. Well, I would say progress comes from not having better answers, but asking better questions. So if you're asking better questions and uh, enjoying yourself, then of course you're making progress. Yeah, I think everybody's, I think growing. I think everybody's growing in spite of themselves. <laughs> Even people who dig in their heels and refuse are going to grow one way or the other. So, uh, and uh, what was the next one, Melinda, Ignacio? Uh, Ignacio uh, has an interesting uh, question. What is the best way to come out of a depression if not becoming one with nature and feeling the embracing love sun rays bestow on our skin? Isn't that a way to reach oneness with God? I'd love to hear your thoughts and feelings on the matter. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Again, um, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, depression can result from certain medical conditions. And there's even uh, evidence of a genetic predisposition to so-called depression. But having said that, the vast majority of depression, sadness, melancholia, despair, is the result of anxiety. And anxiety is rooted in fear, not understanding. That's what fear is. It's not danger. Fear, I need to repeat this a lot. It's the essence of my book, Fearless Intelligence. Fear's got nothing to do with danger. Fear is not understanding. It's a lack of awareness or um, being obtuse or uh, ignorant don't like using words like stupid or ignorant, but there are not a lot of words for a failure to understand, to misunderstand. Uncertainty and confusion, those are good words. That's what fear is. So call it anxiety, call it fear, call it stress, worry, doubt, just a little bit of nervousness or apprehension or some full-blown panic or horror or or paranoia, a little or a lot. That's what's beneath depression. So to get rid of depression and sadness, we need to get rid of anxiety and, and, and fear and stress and worry. And you saw what that meditation did for you. Everybody experienced, I mean, virtually, oh, half of the meditations I do begin with visualizing yourself in a place of perfect peace, a place of ideal relaxation in nature. Because you immediately, you can even do it now, listen to the birds. <laughs> there they are. See, it's so easy to do that. And then to hear the wind in the trees and smell the fragrance and Oh, well, your brain just lights up because it doesn't know the difference between real and imagined. Um, have we ever done this exercise? Let me do this exercise real quickly. Every one of you, I want you to just for a moment, close your eyes and imagine the blackest black, the inkiest void that you can imagine. And then 
against that black background, imagine a bright yellow lemon and see that lemon floating in space before that blackness. But the lemon is brightly lit. It's a beautiful shade of yellow and it's rotating slightly in one direction or another. And you can see the texture of the skin. You can tell which end of the lemon was connected to the tree. And you can imagine without moving at all physically, just imagine yourself reaching out with one hand, touching the lemon, feel how it feels sort of waxy. It's got a texture to it. And you imagine putting it down on a cutting board and with your other hand, take a sharp knife and very carefully, that's a sharp knife, very carefully slice that lemon in half. Maybe it squirts a little bit. Now imagine bringing that lemon up to your nose and inhale deeply the fragrance, that citrusy, lemony fragrance. And then open your mouth and take a big bite of that lemon. And taste the sour juices and <laughs> a little of that juice runs out of the corner of your mouth down your chin. And you pucker and you salivate. <clears throat> you can open your eyes now. I don't know about you guys, but my mouth is full of saliva. I puckered, I salivated. Why would your body react to eating an imaginary lemon when you know you're just pretending and yet the body responded? I'd be curious to know if there's anybody who didn't react to that. <laughs> Usually everybody to some extent will pucker and salivate and, and recall the experience of uh, lemons or lemon juice in your mouth. So the point of the exercise is that the brain doesn't care whether something is real or imagined. If it's real, I mean, it's just light reflecting off the object that's sensed by the optic nerve and interpreted by the brain and the pictures assembled in the brain. You don't see anything out there, not really. You see light reflected off out there in the brain as electrical impulses. Think of what's listening to my voice now. In front of my voice is a microphone with a diaphragm that vibrates and sends electrical impulses along this wire into the computer, digitized into ones and zeros, sent out through Zoom, eventually arrives at a speaker or earbuds or headphones or whatever you got going on, a diaphragm that vibrates, pushes the air, which hits your eardrum, which vibrates. I mean, it's crazy, right? And sends those electrical impulses to the brain that says, well, I heard Michael perfectly clearly. I know what he's saying. Oh, I recognize Michael's voice. Yeah, well, that's crazy. That's just amazing if you think about it. And then you can do that with the other senses as well. Your ability to taste, uh, to smell fragrance, uh, to reach out and, and touch. But there is no difference between real and imagined. It's just all electrical impulses. It's all vibration. So we can reconnect to ourselves spiritually by either going to nature or just closing your eyes and imagining yourself sitting in nature. And with a little practice, you get better and better and better. Also, I want to remind you, Krishnamurti referred to it in that little essay I read. He didn't use the term, but he said, Imagine you're looking at nature, this flower, this blade of grass, this pine cone, whatever, the river, the tree, the clouds. Imagine you're seeing it 
for the first time. This is a technique in Buddhism called beginner's mind. It's a wonderful technique for expanding awareness and raising consciousness. And it's a little game that you play with yourself. And you start with common objects, whatever it is. It could be my coffee cup or my uh, whatever, my throat sprayer bottle here. And if I look at it as if I've never seen it before, I'm going to quickly notice things about it I'd never seen before. And that feeling of noticing, of noticing what you notice, of being aware of what you're aware of, and experiencing that expansion carries over into other things. Now you begin to look at a sunset more completely and with less judgment. <laughs> Is that a good sunset? Oh, I've seen better sunsets. Oh, that sunset would be better if only. It's ridiculous to consider. So why do we judge anything? Well, that's what math is, right? At some point, there are things that need judging. Gee, I got to write a check. Can I afford that? Do I have the money in the bank? It calls for a judgment. But we can rediscover, reconnect, embrace, and um, expand our appreciation of every moment in our lives by looking at it as if it were new and fresh. This lack of time, this idea that there is just this now, this moment that unfolds perpetually. It means every moment is new again. Every breath is a birth. Every breath is new again. Not to mention that the the breath is air that has been breathed over and over and over again by countless human beings. And that was proven in the pandemic, right? And animals and plants. You understand that symbiosis. The plant inhales carbon dioxide and exhales oxygen and the animal inhales oxygen and exhales carbon dioxide. That's pretty damn clever, right? A religious person will say, God figured that out. Scientist is more likely to say, that evolved. Pretty clever in any, there's an inherent intelligence there in any event. Sometimes I wonder why religious people who oppose evolution and science don't consider that Maybe God created evolution. It's not an either or. I, it works for me. So we can go into nature to address Ignacio's question. I love the comment you made, sir, about the loving touch of the warmth of the sun on your skin and that yielding, that letting go into that caress of the warmth of the sun. When it's not too hot, it's just right. It's an embrace, isn't it? And then the gentle breezes, maybe just a little cooler than the still air. When you say, God, what a perfect day. And then you smell the fragrance on the breeze. And then the birds. And suddenly everything you know what I'm reminding myself of is times that I would go backpacking, having lived in Los Angeles, it would take two days, sometimes two and a half days, for the noise to leave my head. So that the first couple of days on the trail, and I used to always backpack alone. Um, I don't recommend you do it, but I did. And uh, foolish though it may be, I always worked on the weekends and had the week off much of my life. 
I had the week off and I worked on weekends. So uh, there weren't too many people who could go with me. And I would do these four or five day hikes. Well, the first day or two, I got music in my head, you know, earworms and commercial jingles. And you asked for it, you got it, Toyota, you know, um, whatever. And then somewhere along the late in the second day or late morning of the third day, all that stuff would fall away. And then I began to hear the sound of my feet on the path. And I heard little scurrying in the bushes. And I heard all kinds of things that I had never heard before. And that happened to me again and again and again. Colors seemed brighter. You come back to the city and everything is so bright. It's like neon. Because you let go of all the stress and anxiety in nature. So if you can't get out there and you can't actually walk in the woods or the meadows, close your eyes and create for yourself a place of perfect peace, a place of ideal relaxation. That'll connect you. That'll put you back in your love, expand your awareness, accelerate your insight, your understanding, your peace of mind. Everything then begins to work and flow again. It's about all the time we have. Anything else, Mindy, before we go? That's it. Alrighty. Well, thank you people for being here. I really love this class. Remember, it's available on YouTube, the full video, the edited audio. I take out the meditation and the Q&A and podcast that. Both are discoverable by searching Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. It's all you need to know. Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. Use the search in YouTube or in your podcast player or a Google search, and you can find uh, all the classes. All the, I think we're at about 59 Wisdom of the Soul classes on the YouTube channel, and the podcast, we're at about 535, I think, something like that. We've been doing that for 14 years. Okay, I'd like you to all unmute and say your uh, hellos and goodbyes and thank you to your friends for being here mahalo aloha namaste and salam and we'll see you next week have a wonderful week thank you namaste Bye. thank you everybody blessings have a great week everybody thanks bye blessings